Hey Java developers, did you know that Microsoft supports your workload with abundant choices, whether you're working on a Java app, app server, or framework? Learn more at developer.microsoft.com forward slash Java. Cloud computing can be thought of as two, or as today's guest will discuss, three different waves. The first wave of cloud computing can be described as virtualization. Along came the VM, and we no longer were running on our physical computes. We introduced virtual machines to our apps. We improved density, resiliency, operations. The second wave came along with containers, and we built orchestrators like Kubernetes to help manage them. Startup times decreased. We improved isolation between teams. We improved flow, velocity. We embraced DevOps. We also really introduced the network into how our applications operated. We've had to adapt and think about that as we've been building apps, taking all of that into consideration. Many have described serverless or functions as a service as a third wave of cloud compute. Today's guest, the CEO of Fermion Technologies, is working on functions as a service delivered via WASM, a WebAssembly. And that will be the topic of today's podcast. Hi, my name is Wes Rice. I'm a technical principal with ThoughtWorks and co-host of the InfoQ podcast. In addition, I chair a software conference called QCon San Francisco. QCon is a community of senior software engineers focused on sharing practical, no marketing-based solutions to real-world engineering problems. If you search the web for deeply technical topics and ran across videos on InfoQ, odds are you've seen some of the talks I'm referring to about QCon. If you're interested in being a part of QCon and contributing to that conversation, the next one is happening at the end of October in the Bay Area. Check us out at QConSF.com. As I mentioned today, our guest is Matt Butcher. Matt is a founding member of dozens of open source projects, including Helm, Cloud Native Application Bundles, Crustlet, Brigade, Open Application Model, Glide, the PHP HTML5 Processor, and Query Path. He's contributed to over 200 open source projects spanning dozens of programming languages. Today on the podcast, we're talking about distributed systems and how WebAssembly can be used to implement functions as a service. Matt, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Wes. In that intro, I talked about two waves of cloud compute. You talk about a third. What is the third wave of cloud compute? Yeah, and and actually spending a little time on the first two autobiographically kind of helps articulate why I think there's a third. You know, I got into cloud services really back when OpenStack got started. I had joined HP and joined the HP Cloud Group right when they really committed a lot of resources into developing OpenStack, which had a full virtual machine layer and object storage and networking and all of that. I came into it as a Drupal developer, of all things. You know, I was doing content management systems and having a great time. I was running the developer CMS system for HP. And as soon as I got like my first taste of the virtual machine world, I was just totally hooked, right? Because it felt magical. In the past, up until that time, we really thought about the relationship between a piece of hardware and the operating system as being sort of like one-to-one, right? My hardware at any given time can only run one operating system. And, you know, I'm one of those people who's been dual booting with Linux since, you know, the 90s. And suddenly the game changed, right? And not only that, but I didn't have to stand up a server anymore, right? I could essentially rent space on somebody else's server and pay their electricity to run my application, right? Yeah, it was magic. Yeah, magic is exactly the word that it felt like at that time, right? And I was just hooked and got really into that world and had a great time working on OpenStack. Then along came containers and, you know, things changed up for me job-wise and I ended up in a different job working on containers. And at the time, I sort of was trying to wrestle through this sort of inner conflict, right? Are containers going to defeat virtual machines or are virtual machines going to defeat containers? And I was at the time really sort of myopically looking at these as competitive technologies where one would come out the victor and the other one would, you know, fall by the wayside of the of computing, right? <laughs> as we've seen happen so many other times with different technologies. And it took me a while, really all through my Deus days up until Microsoft acquired Deus and I got a view of what it looked like inside the sausage factory to realize that, no, what we weren't seeing is two competing technologies. We were really seeing two waves of computing happen. And the first one was us learning how to virtualize workloads using a VM style. And then containers offered an alternative way with some different pros and some different cons. But when you looked at the Venn diagram of features and benefits and even patterns that we used, right, there was actually very little overlap between the two, surprisingly little overlap between the two. So I started kind of reconceptualizing the cloud compute world as, you know, kind of having this sort of wavy kind of structure. And so here we are at Microsoft, 
right? The team that used to be Deus, and then we join Microsoft and we gain new developers from other parts of Microsoft. And we start to interact with, you know, the functions as a service team, the IoT team, the AKS team, and all of these different groups inside of Azure and get a real look, a very, very eye-opening look for what all of this stuff looks like under the hood and what the real struggles are to run a cloud at scale, right? I hate using the term at scale, but that's really what it is there. But also, you know, we're doing open source and we're engaged with startups and medium-sized companies and large companies, all of whom are trying to build technologies using this stuff, you know, containers, virtual machines, object storage, and stuff like that. And so we start seeing where both the megacorp and the startups are having a hard time. And we're trying to solve this by using containers and using virtual machines. And at some point, we started to realize, hey, there are problems we can't solve with either of these technologies, right? We can only push the startup time to containers down to, you know, a few hundred milliseconds. And that's if you are really packing stuff in and really careful about it. You know, virtual machine images are always going to be large because you've always got to package the kernel. So we started this checklist of things. And at some point, it sort of became the checklist of what is the next wave of cloud computing? And that's where we got into WebAssembly, right? We start looking around and saying, okay, what technology candidates are there that might kind of fill a new compute niche where we can pack something together and distribute it onto a cloud platform and have the cloud platform executed? Serverless at the time is getting, and we should come back to serverless later because it's an enticing topic on its own. Serverless was getting popular, but wasn't necessarily solving that problem. And we wanted to address it more at an infrastructure layer and say, is there a third kind of cloud compute? And after looking around at a couple of different technologies, we landed on WebAssembly of all things, you know, a browser technology. But what made it good for the browser, right, that security isolation model, small binary sizes, fast startup times, right? Those are just core things you have to have in a web browser. People aren't going to wait for the application to start. They're not going to tolerate being able to root your system through the browser. And so all these security and performance characteristics and multi-language, multi-architecture characteristics were important for the browser. And that list was starting to match up very closely with the list of things that we were looking for in this kind of third wave of cloud computing. So this became kind of our COVID project. You know, we spent our Fridays. What would it mean to try and write a cloud compute layer with WebAssembly? And that became Crustlet, which is a WebAssembly runtime, essentially, for Kubernetes. And we were happy with that. But we started saying, happy, yes, but is this the right complete solution? Uh, Probably not. And that was about the time we thought, okay, it's time to do the startup thing. Based on all the knowledge we've accrued about how WebAssembly works, we're going to start without the presupposition that we need to run inside of a container ecosystem like Kubernetes, and we just need to start fresh. And that was really what got us kicking with Fermion and what got us excited and what got us to create a company around this idea that we can create the right kind of platform that illustrates what we mean by this kind of third wave of cloud computing. So we're talking about WebAssembly to be able to run like server-side code. Are we talking about a project specifically, like Crustlet's a project? Or are we talking about an idea? What is the focus? Oh, that's a great question because as a startup founder, right, my initial link is, well, we're talking about a project. But actually, I think we're really talking more about an ecosystem. You know, there are several ecosystems we could choose from, you know, the Java ecosystem or the .NET ecosystem as illustrations of this. But I think the Docker ecosystem is such a great example of an ecosystem evolving and one that's kind of recent. So we all kind of remember it. But, you know, there were some core technologies like Docker, of course, and early schedulers, including like Mesos and Swarm and Fleet. And, you know, the key value storage systems like etcd and console. So there were a whole bunch of technologies that sort of co-evolved in order to create an ecosystem. But the core of the ecosystem was the container, right? And that's what I think we are really in probably the first year or two years of seeing that develop inside of WebAssembly, right? A number of different companies and individual developers and scholars in academia have all sort of said, hey, the WebAssembly binary looks like it might be the right foundation for this. What are the technologies we need to build around it? And what's the community structure we need to build around it? Because standardizing is still (laughs) the gotcha for almost all of our big efforts, right? We want things standardized enough so that we can run reliably and understand how things are going to execute and all of that while we all still want to keep enough space open that we can do our own thing, right? And pioneer a little bit. 
So I think that the answer to your question is kind of the ecosystem is the first thing for this third wave of cloud compute. We need groups like Bytecode Alliance, where the focus is on working together to create the specifications like WebAssembly system interface that determines how you interface with a system clock, how you load environment variables, how you read and write files. And we need that as a foundational piece. So there's that in a community, right? There's the conferences like WebAssembly Summit and Blossom Day at KubeCon. And we need those as areas where we can collaborate. And then we need lots and lots of developers, often working for different companies that are all trying to solve a set of problems that define sort of the boundaries of the ecosystem. I think we're in about you know, year one and a half to year two of really seeing that flourishing. Bytecode Alliance has been around a little longer, but only formalized about a year and a half ago. You know, you're seeing a whole bunch of startups like Fermion and Suborbital and Cosmonic and Profion, you know, kind of bubbling up. But you're also seeing Fastly and Cloudflare buying into this, Microsoft, Amazon, Google buying into this. So we're really sort of seeing, once again, the same kind of replay of a ecosystem formation that we saw in the Docker ecosystem when it was Red Hat and Google. And yeah, yeah. So I know of Fastly doing things at the edge, being able to compile things at the edge and be able to run WebAssembly WASM there. I can write you know, WASM applications myself and deploy them with the cloud part. How do I deploy WASM in a cloud native way? How does that work today? In this case, cloud native and edge are similar. Maybe the edge is a little more constrained in some of the things it can do and a little faster to deliver on others. But at the core of it, we need to be able to push a number of artifacts somewhere and understand how they're going to be executed. So we know, for example, we've got the binary, right? A WebAssembly binary file, and then we need some supporting files. So a good example of this is fermion.com is powered by a CMS that we wrote called Bartholomew. So for Bartholomew, right, we need the WebAssembly binaries that serve out the different parts of the site. And it's created with a microservice architecture. I think it's got at this point five different binary files that execute fermion.com. Then we need all of the blog posts and all the files and all the images and all the CSS, some of which are dynamic and some of which are static. And somehow we have to bundle all of these up. This is a great example of where Bytecode Alliance is a great entity to have in a burgeoning ecosystem, right? We need to have a standard way of pushing these bundles up to a cloud. And Fastly's, you know, Computed Edge is very similar, right? We need a way to push their artifacts up to Computed Edge with Fastly or any of these. So there's a working group called SIG Registry that convenes under Bytecode Alliance that's working on defining a package format and defining how we're going to push and pull packages. Essentially, where you think of in the Docker world, right? Pushing and pulling from registries and packaging things up with a Docker file and creating an image file, right? Same kind of thinking is happening in Bytecode Alliance specific to WebAssembly. So SIG registries is a great place to get involved if that's the kind of thing that people are interested in. You can find out about it at bytecodealliance.org. And so that's one of the pieces of community building slash ecosystem building that we've got to be engaged in. So you started a company, Fermion, and now what's the mission of Fermion? Is it to be able to take those artifacts and then be able to deploy them onto a cloud footprint? What is Fermion doing? Yeah, for us, we're really excited about the idea that we can create a cloud runtime that can run in AWS, in Azure, in Google, in DigitalOcean, that can execute these WebAssembly modules and that we can streamline that experience to make it frictionless, right? So it's really kind of a two-part thing, right? We want to make it easy for developers to build these kinds of applications and then make it easy for developers to deploy and then manage these applications over the long term. When you... Think about the development cycle. Oftentimes, as we build these new kinds of systems, we introduce a lot of fairly heavy tooling. Virtual machines are still hard to build for us now, even a decade and some into the ecosystem, right? And technologies like Packer have made it easier, but it's still kind of hard. The number one thing that Docker did amazingly well was create a format that made it easy for people to take their applications that already existed, package them up using a Docker file into an image. And we looked at that and said, could we make it simpler? right? Could we make the developer story easier than that? And the cool thing about WebAssembly is that all these languages are adding support into their compilers. So with Rust, you just add dash dash target wasm32 wasi, and it compiles the binary for you. And so we've really kind of opted for that lightweight tooling. So Spin is our developer tool. And the Spin project is basically designed to assist in what we call the inner loop of development, right? So this is a big Microsoft-y term, I think, inner and outer loop of development. Fast compile times, yeah. 
Yeah. And what we really mean is when you as the individual developer are focused on your development cycle and you've blocked out the world and you're just wholly engaged in your code, you're in your inner loop, right? You're in flow. And so we wanted to build some tools that would help developers when they're in that mode, be able to very quickly and rapidly build WebAssembly-based applications without having to think about the deployment time so much and without having to use a lot of external tools. So Spin is really the one tool that we think is useful there. And we've written VS Code extension to streamline that. And then on the cloud side, you know, you got to run it somewhere. And we built the tool we call Fermion or the Fermion platform to really execute there. And that's kind of a conglomeration of a number of open source projects with a nice dashboard on top of it that you can install into DigitalOcean or AWS or Azure or whatever you want and get it running there. And that runs a full WASM binary? Earlier, I talked functions as a service. Does it run like functions or does it run full WASM binaries? Yeah, and this gets us back into the serverless topic, which we were talking about earlier. And serverless, I think, has always been a great idea, right? And the core of this is, can we make it possible so that the developer doesn't even have to think about what a server is? Exactly, the plumbing. Yeah, And functions as a service to me is just about the purest form of serverless that you can get, where not only do you not have to think about the hardware or the operating system, but you don't even have to think about the web framework that you're running in, right? You're merely saying, when a request comes into this endpoint, I'm going to handle it this way and I'm going to serve back this data. So within moments of starting your code, you're deep into the business logic and you're not worried about, okay, I'm going to stand up an HTTP server. It's got to listen on this port. Here's the SSL configuration. No daemon sets. It's all part of the platform. Yeah. And as a developer, you know, that to me is like, oh, that's what I want. I <laughs> No thousand lines of YAML config. So serverless and functions as a service were looking like very promising models to us. So as we built out Spin, we decided that at least as the first primary model that we wanted to use, we wanted to use that particular model. So Spin, for example, it functions more like an event listener where you say, okay, on an HTTP request, here's the request object, do your thing and send back a response object. Or as a Redis listener, when a message comes in on this channel, here's the message, do your thing, and then, you know, optionally send something back. And that model really is much closer to Azure Functions and Lambda and technologies like that. And we picked that because developers seem to really enjoy that. Developers say they really enjoy that model. And we think it's a great complement for WebAssembly. So it really gets you thinking about writing microservices in terms of very, very small chunks of code and not in terms of HTTP servers that happen to have microservice infrastructure built in. So Spin lets you write this kind of this inner loop, fast flow, event driven model where you can kind of respond to the events that are going like the serverless model. And then you're able to package that into WASM that can then be deployed with Fermion Cloud. Is that the idea? Yeah. And there, you know, when you think about writing a typical HTTP application, even going back to, say, Rails, Rails and Django, I think, really defined how we think about HTTP applications. And and you have got this concept of the routing table, right? And in the routing table, you say, when somebody hits slash foo, then that executes my foo module. If I hit slash bar, that executes my bar module. That's really the direction that we went with the programming model, where when you hit fermion.com slash index, you know, it executes the WebAssembly module that generates the index file and serves that out. When you hit slash static slash file dot JPEG, it loads the file server and serves it back. And I think that model really kind of resonates with pretty much all modern web application and microservice developers. But all the writing in the backend is just a function. And I really like that model because it just feels like you're getting right to the meat of what you actually care about within a moment of starting your application instead of a half hour or an hour later when you've written out all the scaffolding for it. So what about state? You mentioned Redis before, having Redis listeners. How do you manage state when you're working with Spin or with Fermion Cloud? How does that come into play? That's a great architectural discussion for microservices as a whole. And we really have felt strongly that what we have observed, you know, coming from, you know, Deus and Microsoft and then on into Fermion or Google in the case of some of the other engineers who work on Fermion, Google into Fermion. We've seen the microservice pattern be successful repeatedly and statelessness has been a big virtue of the microservice model as far as the binary keeping state internally, right? But you got to put stateful information somewhere. At some point. (laughs) Yep. And the easy one is, well, you can put it in files, right? And WASI and and WebAssembly, you know, introduced file support two years ago, right? And that was good, but that's not really where you want to stop, right? So with Spin, we began experimenting with 
adding some additional ones like Redis support and generic key value storage, which is coming out in a release very soon. Database support is coming out really soon. And those kinds of things. Spin, by the way, is open source. So you can actually go see all these PRs kind of in flight as we work on Postgres support and stuff like that. It's coming along. And the strategy we want to use is the same strategy that you used in Docker containers and other stateless microservice architectures, right? Where state gets persisted in the right kind of data storage for whatever you're working on, be that a caching service or a relational database or a NoSQL database. We are hoping that as the WebAssembly component model and other similar standards kind of solidify, we're going to see this kind of stuff not be a spin-specific feature, but just the way that WebAssembly as a whole works. And different people using different architectures will be able to pull the same kinds of components and get the same kind of feature set. Yeah, very cool. When we were talking just before we started recording, you mentioned that you wanted to talk a little bit about performance of WebAssembly and how it's changed. I remember, I guess a year ago, maybe two years ago, I did a podcast with Lynn Clark. We were talking about Fastly and running WebAssembly at the edge, like we were talking about before. And if I remember right, I may be wrong, but if I remember right, it was like three milliseconds was like the overhead that was for like the inline request compile time, which I thought was impressive. But you said you're way lower than that now. What is the request level inline performance time of WebAssembly these days? We're lower now. Fastly's lower now as an eco. We've learned a lot in the last couple of years about how to optimize and how to pre-initialize and cache things ahead of time. So three milliseconds, even a year and a half ago, would have been a very good startup time. Then we are pushing down toward a millisecond, and now we are sub one millisecond. And so again, let's characterize this in terms of these three waves of cloud computing, right? A virtual machine, which is a powerhouse, right? You start with the kernel and you got the file system and you've got all the process table and everything, you know, starting up and initializing and then opening sockets and everything. That takes minutes to do, right? Then you get to containers and containers on average take a dozen seconds to start up, right? And you can push down into the low seconds range. And if you get really aggressive and you're really not doing very much, you might be able to get into the hundred milliseconds or the several hundred milliseconds range. And so one of the core features that we think this third wave of cloud compute needed, one of our criteria coming in was it's got to be in the tens of milliseconds. So that was a design goal coming out of the gate for us. And the fact that now we're seeing that push down below the millisecond marker for being able to get from cold state VM to something executing to that first, you know, instruction, having that under a millisecond is just phenomenal. Right. In many ways, we've kind of learned lessons from the JVM and the CLR and and lots and lots of other research that's been done in this area. And in another, some of it just comes about because with both us and with Fastly and other cloud providers, distinctly from the browser scenario, right, we can preload code compile it ahead of time into native and then be able to have it sort of cached there and ready to go because we know everything we need to know about what the architecture and what the system is going to look like when that first invocation hits. And that's why we can really start to drive times way, way down. So occasionally you'll see a blog post of somebody saying, well, WebAssembly wasn't terribly fast when I ran it in the browser. And then those of us on the cloud side are saying, well, we can just make it blazingly fast. A lot of that difference is because the things that the runtime has to be able to learn about the system at execution time in the browser, we know way ahead of time on the cloud. And so we can optimize for that. And I wouldn't be surprised to see, you know, Fastly, Fermion, other companies pushing even lower until it really does start to appear to be at native or faster than native speeds. That's awesome. Again, I haven't really tracked WebAssembly in the last year and a half or so, but some of the other challenges were like types and I think component approach to where you could share things. How has that advanced over the last year and a half? What is the state of that today? Specifications often move in fits and starts, right? And W3, by the way, the same standards body that does CSS, HTML, and HTTP, you know, this is the same standards body that works on WebAssembly. And types was one of the initial, how do we share type information? And that morphed in and out of several other models. And ultimately, what's emerged out of that is borrowing heavily from existing academic work on components, WebAssembly is now gaining a component model. So what that means in practice is that when I compile a WebAssembly module, I can also build a file that says, these are my exported functions, and this is what they do, and these are the types that they use. And you know, types here aren't just like ints and floats and strings, right? We can build up very elaborate struct-like types where we say, you know, this is a shopping cart, and a shopping cart has a count of items, and an item looks like this. And the component model for WebAssembly can articulate what those look like. 
but it also can do a couple of other really cool things. And this is where I think we're going to see WebAssembly really break out. Developers will be able to do things in WebAssembly that they have not yet been able to do using other popular architectures, other popular paradigms. And this is that WebAssembly can articulate, okay, so when this module starts up, it needs to have something that looks like a key value storage. Here's the interface that defines it, right? I need to be able to put a string string and I need to be able to get string and get back a string object or I need to, you know, a cache where it lives for X amount of time or else I get a cache miss. But it has no real strong feelings about, no really strong, it doesn't have any feelings at all. It's binary. <laughs> it has no real strong. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Give it time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anthropomorphizing code. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then at startup time, you know, we can articulate, okay, Fastly can say, well, we've got a cache-like thing and it'll handle these requests. And Fermion can say, well, we don't, but we can load a Docker container that has those cache-like characteristics and expose a driver through that. And suddenly applications can be sort of built up based on what's available in the environment. Now, because WebAssembly is multi-language, what this means is effectively, for the most part, we've been writing the same tools over and over again in JavaScript and Ruby and Python and Java. You know, if we can compile all to the same binary format and we can expose the imports and exports for each thing, then suddenly language doesn't make so much of a difference. And so, you know, whereas in the past we've had to say, okay, here's what you can do in JavaScript and here's what you can do in Python. Now we can say, well, here's what you can do. And reuse components. Yep. Yeah. And whether the key value store is written in Rust or C or, you know, Erlang or whatever, as long as it's compiled to WebAssembly, my JavaScript application can use it and my Python app can use it. And that's where I think we should see a big difference in the way we can start constructing applications by aggregating binaries instead of fetching a library and building it into our application. Yeah, it's cool. Speaking of language support, it was another thing that you wanted to talk about. There's a lot of changes, momentum, and things that have been happening with languages themselves in support of WebAssembly, like switches, those things with Node. We talked about Blazor for a minute. What's happening in the language space when it comes to WebAssembly? To us, WebAssembly will not be a real viable technology until there is really good language support, right? So on Fermion.com, we actually track the status of the top 20 languages as determined by Redmonk. And we watch very closely and we continually update our matrix of what the status is of WebAssembly in these languages. Rewind again, back only a year or two, and all the checkboxes are checked are basically C and Rust, right? Both great languages, both well-respected languages, both not usually the first languages a developer says, yeah, this is my go-to language, right? Rust is gaining popularity, of course, and we love Rust, but JavaScript wasn't on there. Python wasn't on there. Ruby wasn't on there. Java and C Sharp certainly weren't on there. What we've seen over only like a year, year and a half is just language after language, first announcing support and then rapidly delivering on it. So earlier this year, I mean, I was ecstatic when I saw in just the space of like two weeks, Ruby and Python both announce that the C Ruby and C Python runtimes were compilable to WebAssembly with WASI, which effectively meant all of a sudden Spin, which applications were kind of limited to Rust and C at the time, could suddenly do Python and Ruby applications. And Go, the core project, is a little bit behind on WebAssembly support, but the community picked up the slack and Tiny Go can compile Go programs into WebAssembly plus WASI. And so Go came along, you know, right around, actually a little bit earlier than Python and Ruby. But now what we're seeing, I mean, like now being in the last couple of weeks, right, is the beginning of movement from the big enterprise like languages, right? Microsoft has been putting a lot of work into WebAssembly in the browser over the past with the Blazor framework, which essentially ran by compiling the CLR, the runtime for C Sharp and those languages into WebAssembly and then interpreting the DLLs. But what they've been saying is that was just the first step, right? The better way to do it is to compile C Sharp, F Sharp, all the CLR supported languages directly into WebAssembly and be able to run them directly inside of a WebAssembly runtime, which means big performance boost, much smaller binary sizes. And all of a sudden it's easy to start adding support for newly emerging specifications because it doesn't have to get routed through multiple layers of indirection. So Steve Sanderson, who's one of the lead, I think he's the lead PM for the .NET framework has been showing off a couple times since KubeCon in Valencia now, I think four or five different places has shown off where they are in supporting, you know, .NET to WebAssembly with WASI. And 
It's astounding. So often we've thought of languages like C Sharp as being sort of like reactive, looking around at what's happening elsewhere and kind of reacting, but they're not. They are very forward thinking engineers and David Fowler's brilliant and the stuff they're doing is awesome. Now they've earmarked WebAssembly as the future, as one of the things they really want to focus on. And I'm really excited. My understanding is the next version of .NET will have full support for compiling to native WebAssembly and the working drafts of betas are up now. Yeah, that's awesome. You mentioned that there's work happening with Java as well. So Java, the CLR, that's amazing. Yep. Kotlin 2 is also working on a native implementation. So I think we'll see Java, Kotlin, the .NET languages all coming. I think they'll be coming by the end of the year, right? I'm optimistic. I have to be because I'm a startup founder. And if you're not optimistic, uh, <laughs> you won't survive. But I think they'll be coming by the end of the year. I think you'll really start to see the top 20 languages. I think we'll see probably 15 plus of them support WebAssembly by the end of the year. That's awesome. So let's come back for a second to Fermion. We're going to wrap up here, but I wanted you to kind of walk through. There's an app that you talk about, Waggy, that's on one of your blog posts. That kind of how you might go about using Spin, how you use Fermion Cloud. Could you walk through what it looks like to bootstrap an app and kind of talk about just what does it look like for me? If I wanted to go use Fermion Cloud, what would it look like? Spin's the tool you'd use there. Waggy is actually just sort of a description of how to write an application. So when you're writing it, think about Waggy as one of those ways to write a sort of functions of service language. So, you know, you download Spin from our GitHub repository and you type in Spin new and then the type of application you want to write and the name. So say I want to create Hello World in Rust, it's Spin new Rust Hello World. And that command scaffolds out. It runs the cargo commands in the background and creates your whole application environment. And when you open it from there, it's going to look like your regular old Rust application. The only thing that's really happening behind the scenes is wiring up all the pieces for the component model and for the compiler so that you don't have to think about that. So spin new, you've got your Hello World app created instantly. You can edit it however you normally edit. I use VS Code. From there, you type in spin build. It'll build your binary for you. And again, largely it's invoking the Rust compiler in Rust's case or the tiny Go compiler in Go's case or whatever. And then spin deploy will push it out to Fermion. So assuming you've got a Fermion instance running somewhere, you can spin deploy and have it pushed out there. If you're doing your local development, you can just, instead of typing spin deploy, you can type spin up and it'll create you a local web server and be running your application inside of there. So the local development story is super easy there. In total, we say you should be able to get your first spin application up and running in two minutes or less. How do you target different endpoints for when you deploy out to the cloud? Or do you not worry about it? That's what you pay Fermion for, for example. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so you're building your routing table as you build the application. There's a toml file in there called spin.toml where you say, okay, if they hit slash, then they load this module. If they hit slash foo, they hit that module. And it supports, you know, all the normal things that routing tables support. But from there, when you push it out to the Fermion platform, the platform will provision your SSL certificate, set up a domain name for you. The Fermion dashboard that comes as part of that platform will allow you to set up environment variables and things like that. So as the developer, you're really kind of just thinking merely in terms of how you build your binary and what you want to do. And then once you deploy it, then you can log into the Fermion dashboard and start tweaking and doing the DevOpsy side of what we would call the outer loop of development. So what's next for Fermion? We are working on our software as a service because, again, you know, our goal is to make it possible for anybody to be able to run spin applications and get them up and running in two minutes or less, even when that means deploying them out somewhere where they've got a public address. So while right now, if you want to run Fermion, you got to go install it in your AWS cluster, or your Google Cloud cluster, whatever. As we unroll this service later on this year, it should make it possible for you to get that started just by typing spin deploy and have that up and running inside of Fermion the SaaS. Well, very cool. Well, Matt, thank you for taking some time to catch up and help us further understand what's happening in the WASM community and tell us about Fermion and Fermion Cloud. Thanks so much for having me. Hey, folks, our upcoming international QCon software conferences are starting to take shape. We're back in San Francisco this October 24th through 28th online, November 29th through December 9th, and in London in 2023 from March 27th through 29th. At QCon, you'll find practical inspiration and best practices on how to implement emerging software trends directly from senior software developers at innovator early adopter companies. They'll help you adopt the right patterns and practices moving forward. Learn more at QConferences.com. Hope to see you there.